The Variety Artist, episode 26. This one's all about circus arts. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your phone or mobile device. That way you'll get a fresh new podcast every single Monday. And if you haven't already, join my Facebook group, The Variety Artist, where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests. Now let's start the show. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. My guest today is a true circus artist. His talents include sideshow feats like sword swallowing, fire eating, and human blockhead. Circus skills like clowning, juggling, and unicycle. Western skills like trick roping, knife throwing, and gun spinning. I could go on and on. He's one of the founding members of the world famous Bindle Stiff Family Circus. Known as Kinko the Clown, Mr. Penny Gaff, Professor, and on a very rare occasion, Kinkette. Variety artist, I give you Keith Nelson. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here, John. Thanks for the <laughs> invite. What's going on, Keith? Oh, hanging out and got, spending some time talking to you and I guess the greater world eventually. Cool. Now, I mentioned nine or ten skills, and that isn't even the half of it. I, I have also written down and looked up, uh, you do plate spinning, balloon twisting, bed of nails, bolo, bullwhip, giant spinning top, acrobats, still walking, archery, balancing. You even play the tuba, is that right? That is correct. I have my first tuba gig coming up in about two weeks um, in a Spiegel <laughs> tent up in Rochester. Haven't touched it in, um, on stage in probably 15 years. Once you have the skill, you've got to keep it on the resume just in case. <laughs> Do you, so you haven't picked it up at all? You haven't practiced it at all? I mean, I've picked it up because I've had to move it out of the way to get other props pretty regularly. But um, <laughs> as far as I, I blew on it a couple weeks ago just to make sure I still could, and I'll put at least one or two more practices in before the gig. Oh my. Now, before we're going to talk about Bindle Stiff, and we're going to talk about all your talents and, and, and all those different things. But before we do that, what does your personal life look like? When I was doing research, I was seeing you're traveling all over. Do you have a house? Um, I, I have a house in Hudson and a studio in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Are you married? Do you have a, what do you, what, what's your personal life look like? Stephanie and I, who she's a co-founder of Bindle Stiff, have been um, together for about 25 years. Oh. And there is no paper um, that documents our relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did not see the need to have a government that seems to be messing up relationships left and right be a part of mine. Right. And you've been together for 25 years, so you must be doing something right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I do, I do um, you know, I am a ordained minister so every every year or two i do take part in a wedding just to keep it out of my system so you could actually marry yourself correct but usually i pick other people <laughs> it's, it's it's easier that way or they pick they pick me i guess i don't pick them <laughs> yeah. now do you perform on your own or is it just with bindle stiff um i perform on my own i perform in other shows i perform with bindle stiff you know, if you um, have a need, I will be there. Like in Rochester, I will be performing with Matt Morgan, who's a clown out of Vegas, um, mm -hmm. in a show that he's created. Much of last year, I was performing at the Borgata in Atlantic City in what was called the Burlesque Show, which was a big production stage show. So, yeah, pretty much if you have a, a show that needs any of the skills I have, I'm available. Sure. We're going to get into Bindle stuff a lot. That's, that's going to be probably the main part of this interview. But uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions before. Uh, you toured with the Grateful Dead? Um, when I was 15, I jumped in the back of a pickup truck with some folks in North Carolina and went to my first Dead show. And then on and off for the... I don't know, next decade, I spent a lot of time in parking lots, um, which is where I was introduced to my gateway prop, the devil stick. Oh. So, you know, I, in, a, in a sense, you can blame the dead on that trajectory. It was through Boy Scouts that I got turned on to the dead, and then through dead that I got turned on to devil sticks and travel for, um, you know, a good decade. I was using rainbow gatherings, the Grateful Dead, and various protests as my methods of travel uh -huh. that I would go from kind of one event to the next saying, where are you going next? Can I jump in your van? Well, now let, let's get into Bindle Stiff. Do you mind? I, I looked at your mission statement. Do you mind if I read your mission statement? 
Sure, I can't remember. I, we're in the process of revising our mission statement, so it's you know sl slightly dated. But yeah, go oh, ahead. Oh, here's what it is because I love it. I love it. The mission of Bindlestiff Family Circus is to bring joy and wonder into the world. We cultivate, develop, and sustain the circus and variety arts. We celebrate tradition while maintaining an irreverent spirit, keeping the circus arts current, accessible, and relevant. That's us. That's you. <laughs> What is a, a, a bindle stiff? Um, bindle stiff is a term for vagabond or hobo. It actually means the stick in the bundle that, like when you think of kind of the old image of, you know, somebody running away from home, it's, it's that stick in the bundle. Between pretty much the Civil War and World War I, it became synonymous, uh, or the term became synonymous with the hobos jumping on the trains. Uh, Stephanie and I were basically on our way to um, Burning Man back in the early 90s. We were jumping on trains with a case of pyrotechnics and a case of costume, and it felt like the fitting name for the troupe that we were creating. So you performed at, at Burning Man a lot of times? We went from, I think, Stephanie, my first year was 94, and 1999 was the last year. Um, and that, the first year was just Stephanie and I in a tent with no stakes. So every time the wind started blowing, we had to run back to the tent, lay on the floor so it wouldn't blow away. <laughs> you know, we went with, I think, three packs of dried hummus and maybe one gallon of water. Not really too prepared for desert living. But then after that, and kind of having a knowledge of what ben, um, Burning Man was, we started bringing the entire Bindle Stiff troop and would come out and create a circus ring in the middle of the desert for a good five years. I have some friends that are there right now. They're called the Moon Kindred Group, and they're doing something similar to what you did 20 years ago. It was a little bigger now. I think it's, what, 70,000 or 700,000 people in the middle of the desert. You know, back in that, our era, it was a little smaller. There were drive-by shooting ranges and no street signs, so you could get completely lost. Wait, wait, I live near LA. What's a drive-by shooting range? Basically, folks with automatic weapons and pickup trucks with targets, and you'd drive by and blow them away. It was kind of a, um, the early days of Burning Man were a little bit more um, Mad Maxi sort of feel than they are today. It, you know, you had fewer people, fewer regulations, and just, you know, a lot of desert to play in. Wait, so people would carry guns in their car and then they'd drive by these targets and they'd just shoot them? The 80s and 90s were a different America than we live in today. Wow. That's great. That's crazy. <laughs> so what was the first time when you said, I want to be involved in the circus? What, what was the first thing that you saw or did? A couple of things that really inspired me. Um, when I was probably around 10 or 11, I was raised in North Carolina, and we went to see a Mexican mud show. And a mud show, for those that aren't familiar, is a circus tented show that basically moves every single day. Set up the tent, you do your couple shows. At night, you break down the tent, move to the next location. So my family took me to this little mud show in Moxville, North Carolina. Either at intermission or at the end of the show, they had, you could see the elephant dog for a quarter. You know, you went up there, you paid your 25 cents, you went around um, the tarp, and there on the other side was a shaved dog. Oh. And it was kind of at that moment that I realized that you could shave a dog and make money. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think that little thing really put a, um, it kind of helped set the stage for the future. Sure. So you had that moment, and then also kind of around that same time, I got a Emmett Kelly ventriloquist doll. Looking back, I'm not sure why you make a vent doll out of a silent clown, but at that point, Cramp Clown really started having <laughs> an impact on me and kind of getting me into just, you know, researching a little bit of circus. But it was once I got to Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, my best friend, David Hunt, who went on to be co-founder of Circus Bella, he's currently... Um, the director at Prescott Circus, and he was the president of the American Youth Circus Organization. But back in college days, he, he and I were really good buddies. He introduced me to juggling, kind of taught me the basics. And then a year later, I traded a bottle of whiskey with a group of jugglers and learned fire eating. Oh. So in my few years at Hampshire College, the two marketable skills that I left with, which were not school related, were juggling and fire eating. Moved to New York, got a job as a fire eater in an exotic cabaret. And it was kind of at that moment that I was like, oh, you can make a living doing this. Right. And really haven't looked back since. Yeah, I love making a living performing. It's, it's, it's the best thing in the world. I mean, I, at this point, I really couldn't imagine doing it in any other way. You know, after a quarter of a century, I don't know if I have other skills that work. Yeah, I have no other skills. 
In fact, I've based my entire career on having no skill. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I can, you know, I can do, I guess, web design slower than anybody would ever hire. I can edit a video slower than anybody would ever hire, but that's because, it, you know, for much of this time, I've been too cheap or too poor to um, hire other people to do that work for me. Yeah, we do have to learn to do those things as variety artists, as people that make our living performing. Not only do we have to uh, know how to perform whatever act we do, but yeah, you're right. We also do have to do website design, social media marketing, snail mail marketing, be able to write a nice marketing piece and be able to sell our shows. So we have to do a bookkeeping. We have to be able to do a little bit of everything, right? Exactly. You know, you're, you're your own CEO along with um, your own custodian. Mm-hmm. You never know what kind of job you're going to get, you know, like, um, like the guy who's shoveling elephant poop, you know, at least I'm still in showbiz. That's right. <laughs> well, what is, is it Ward Hall? Ward Hall is considered by many as the Zigfield of the cornfield is what he's been called. But Ward ran Circus Sideshow on Carnival Lots for decades and his show is still out there. Now, is this, is this something that you worked in? I, yes, it was. He kind of turned me out, if you will. You know, we came off of a Bindle Stiff tour, and David Hunt and um, Danny the Rubber Boy, who now lives in LA. I don't know if you're familiar with him. No, but David, Danny, and I, um, we were on Bindle Stiff tour. We, we met Ward in Florida. He was basically like, So, what are you doing these dates? And it was kind of right at the end of our tour ending. So we were like, we're available. And he told us to come to the Meadowland Fair, told us the dates that we're supposed to be there. He said, the shows are start on this date. We arrived there. The trucks are parked in the parking lot. There are no tents set up. And over the next three days, we learn about sledgehammers, hammer jacks, and clove hitches and how to set up a tent. Oh. We're doing 20 to 30 shows a day on the Carnival Midway. Real old school sideshow with the fat man, the fire eating midget, the bearded lady, total grind show. You know, when you're doing 20 shows a day, all you can do is get better because after each one, you're like, what went wrong? Oh, you know, and you start tweaking and fixing and to have that kind of experience so early in a performing career is pretty amazing because, I mean, after you work the carnival sideshow doing those sorts of number of shows in that kind of condition, there's almost no gig that you'll ever get that you're like, oh, I can't do this. I can't handle it. Well, yeah. yeah. It was an honor to work for him. You know, he was like, so what's the least amount you will work for? And oh. then he offered us $5 less than that. <laughs> and we all took it because to, you know, to work for a legend such as Ward is a gift. Yeah, and to get your feet wet doing 20 shows a day. Gosh. Exactly. And then, you know, when you're working for such a legend, everybody's coming by to, you know, come say hi to Ward. And you kind of, through that, you, you get to, you know, be introduced and see a lot of other friends you wouldn't otherwise see. All right. Well, now tell me the story of Danny the Rubber Boy. So Bindle Stiff is on tour. Um, we are in the Redneck Riviera, the Texas Panhandle, playing Pensacola Beach. This boy comes up and says, you know, can I get into the show for free tonight and do a couple minutes on your stage? And we're like, sure, why not? So Danny comes on the stage and contorts his body in just so many amazing grotesque positions. <laughs> so all of our jaws are kind of on the floor that, you know, this young fellow kind of came out of nowhere and, and did that. So the next day we're in New Orleans. Danny reappears and lets us know that overnight he had given away all his possessions his apartment and really had nothing to go to you know it's like so can I join the show oh at that point we're what, five or six of us in a van playing punk rock dives and rock venues and you know sometimes making $150 for the entire van to then try to feed everybody you know so the idea of taking another performer on was pretty big decision but every time he's like he's like I don't eat much I can sleep under the floor under the van you know being a a young contortionist, he could ball up and fit just about anywhere. <laughs> okay. You know, this was one of those beautiful situations of somebody actually running away with the circus. So then Danny joined us and then came and did the carnival with Ward and myself and then met a few other folks and did some other fair dates with um, other producers. He's been, you know, he's traveled the world. He's been in numerous movies and um, lives in, I think, Los Angeles currently and is doing a fabulous job. But, you know, it's just amazing to see kind of that whole transition happen and to so actively be a part of helping somebody, you know, find the spotlight. Oh, yeah. What a great success story. 
he joined back then. Do you have your core group now or do you accept anybody in the Bindlestiff family? We don't accept anybody. We accept, um, yeah, we, um, we still, <laughs> um, we, we're, we we're always open to folks and each production that we do is a slightly different cast. I mean, the, you know, the reality is we aren't able to provide enough work for anybody to ever give up everything they do and be with Bindlestiff. Most of our artists, you know, have their own solo or, or other projects that they're involved in. So whenever we get a set of dates or a project coming up, you know, the first thing is who we want to work with and then seeing who out of you want to work with is available and then who can afford whatever budget we have available for that project. So the cast is always changing. We run a circus open mic night once a month in New York, which is a really good opportunity for Bindlestiff to kind of see people's work in a live setting so we can kind of you know, start connecting. And there's been a good handful of performers that we've taken who we you know, were introduced through the open stage and now are you know, involved in more and more Bindlestiff projects. Where is that? So people listening to this. Um, it's a place called Dixon Place, which is on, at 161 Christie Street in New York City. It's mm -hmm. um, basically the first Monday of every month, except in September. It'll be the second because of the holiday. But it's, it's um, 7.30 at night. The first 10 people that email me that they want to be in the show or basically in the show. You know, if I get four magicians asking for one particular date, I'll try to talk them into a selecting different dates so we aren't having to spend the entire night watching, you know, four or five magicians or four or five aerial acts but it really is the you know the first 10 folks that ask and i don't pretty much don't say no to anybody the only rule on the venue or one of the main rules is no glitter okay because it's tough to clean up and yeah and the venue does not want to deal with that reality of having to deal with glitter in their theater all the time um, yeah. and it's kind of an amazing thing because we get everything from kind of the performing arts spoken word world of New York to world-class entertainers passing through saying, Hey, I just want to have a night and do say that I played New York to, um, you know, somebody wanting to shoot a video for their promo to emerging artists getting on stage for the first time to somebody trying out something that may have not worked 10 years ago. And they feel that the world has changed and maybe it'll work this time. Hmm. So it's kind of, it's just an amazing mix. And then the audience is, probably 60% um, artist, you know, because we really, the, the night was created more as a kind of community night. What do art, artists need? You know, luckily we have a big following. There's a, a solid audience. It's almost always a full house, but I've never really paid attention to building the audience. It's always been about what artists need to improve. Because if we're not, you know, giving opportunity for people to go out there and fail, we're not going to see success stories. Right. Um, so, so that's the open stage. And, you know, I encourage folks if they're passing through New York, you know, just at least come hang out. And it's a great night of meeting New York variety artists, producers, agents, you know, it really is an industry community sort of evening. And for those that are, you know, wanting a little stage time, it's a great way for New York to see what you do. Now, do you just do the one night at Dixon Place or do you folks perform there on any sort of regular basis? For Dixon Place, that is... Um, Pretty much all we do, like the, the open stage has a $12 suggested donation. So if somebody only has $3, we're not going to turn them away at the door. The last Bindlestiff Family Circus Cabaret, which is a bit more kind of a, a little, I guess, you know, kind of higher brow show, if you will. We bring in live music. You know, we're very selective on the artists involved in that. Um, and the ticket prices are 25 to $40 for that kind of experience. So sure. it's hard to get um, a venue where everybody's used to paying a suggested donation to then see that it's still bindle stiff, but it's a different show. Why am I paying twice as much? So we generally find a different venue and kind of market it in a very different way to, um, to entice folks. That makes sense. That makes complete sense. Because uh, if, if, if I'm going to a place paying $12, yeah, I don't want to go to the same place and pay $40. But if you go to a different venue, that, that totally makes sense. And then we, we try to pick the venues that work well with the show. Like on this, um, on this last show, which I'm you know, trying to kind of create it into a package that'll work really well in like casinos and high-end showrooms. We had a husband and wife target crossbow act involved, the one-legged tap dancer, an old school amazing magician named David Kaplan. 
uh-huh. and live band and, you know, and really created like a tight one hour, high energy, a lot of things that you'll not see almost anywhere else sort of show and put it up in a very pretty room, if you will. Mm-hmm. I always feel that when you walk into a venue, it's really nice for the venue to create a mood, create a scene. Um, it makes the performer's life a lot easier when venue says something, if you will, or has a character of its own. Yeah, and there's perceived value for the audience, too. When they walk into a place and they see it's a nice place, they will pay a higher dollar. And then you feel like you're walking into a theater. You know, I'm, I'm seeing more and more, you see this in New York, of higher-end theaters that when you walk into the front, feel like a giant box store. Mm. I like the old proscenium. I like the old, just the feeling of being in a theater with character and energy and history. So do I. I love that. You know, when you've had an audience sitting in a venue for, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, being able to look around and look at the murals, look at the art, look at the balconies and, you know, and just be impressed with the venue before the curtain opens. It makes your life so much easier than, you know, when you're out performing in a parking lot, everybody's in the beating sun. You have to work so hard to get that same level of, of energy. That's one of the reasons I love when you see uh, an old theater being renovated. You, you think it was built in the 20s or the 30s, and maybe it has some sort of crazy art deco design. I love seeing that rebuilt because when you walk in, all of a sudden, you, know, you like you're saying, you know, you're looking around at all the different walls and the murals and the sculptures and the different things, the balconies. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I think it's a very sad statement that we see more and more of them becoming Starbucks instead of theaters. But <laughs> that's true. It is the nature of the way they treat the performing arts in America. Yeah. And, and, you know, the dichotomy of that is that our entire life is, ba- I mean, me, you, everybody, our entire life is based around entertainment. It's based around television film, live theater, anything that we can do to entertain ourselves and get out of work for five minutes. And yet performers aren't treated as people that make a huge difference in other people's lives. And even if they do, they are not treated with that respect. I mean, if you look at certain shows on television that basically exploit us and we are the focal point of it and they do not pay us to be on it, where every grip, every producer, every person calling to ask you to be on it is paid to me is um, obscene. Oh yeah. How many, how many calls do you get where they say, oh yeah, uh, we're doing this benefit and we'd like you to do this for free. Although you know the caterer is being paid, the person doing the lighting is being paid, everybody else is being paid. But Keith, we'd like you to do it for free. I mean, like when, when AGT calls, I always ask if the person on the phone is being paid to call me. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Since we're talking about venues, what is the craziest venue that you can remember performing in? Oh, there's so many good ones. There, there's the outhouse in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is a punk rock dive sitting in the middle of a cornfield with no running toilet or water. <laughs> Barely had enough power for the lights and the sound. And we made the mistake of putting our banner up and then pretty much had to stay in the venue till 5 a.m. till the last punk band finished in order to get our props oh. on the stage. Next time, we'll take it down immediately. So we've had that. We had a whole Bindle Stiff show in a friend's attic in Los <laughs> Angeles. I mean, he had, a, he had a small stage built in his attic. So when I say attic, you know, we're not talking about up in Grandma's act, at, you know, attic. It was definitely an attic that was somewhat made for performance, but definitely not quite big enough for circus. So we had the slack wire going over the audience with a machete oh. juggler. It was definitely a um, very immersive experience, you know, but this is audience safety was less important back in those days. You know, the experience meant sure. a lot. And this is like early days of Burning Man, you know, you see, before liability um, was being whispered around every corner. Oh, yeah. That's one of the first things I'm always asked when I'm asked to do a gig. You know, do you have, uh, you have insurance? Yeah, of course I do. Exactly. Uh, but that is one of the first things that they asked. In fact, a, a number of my friends have not been hired or have been uh, unhired, let's say, because they don't have a particular type of insurance. And I mean, I think it's crazy for a performer these days to not be insured, you know, even with my anarchistic roots, just with the mindset of America and how folks want to, you know, sue when somebody bumps, stubs your toe, they want to sue everybody within a hundred yards, yep. you know, for $250. 
you can go out there and get specialty, you know, cl like through Clowns of US or, you know, the insurance is available for under 300 bucks. So for that's the liability insurance. I'm with specialty. So I know exactly what you're talking about. We have to have board insurance and staff insurance. The amount of money that is being spent, you know, and then, you know, folks ask why rates are so high, you know, to hire an artist because what you're paying only a little bit of that's ending up in the artist's pocket. Each year it's more fees. I mean, especially we're a nonprofit company. So, you know, every year for us is more fees, more paperwork, more people we have to hire just to push the paperwork. You know, more weird insurances popping up that you never heard of before. Okay, we got all serious for a minute. <laughs> we'll, we'll get more fun now. Tell me about your, at nighttime, it gets a, you do a racier show. Is that right? A burlesque type show or you can do? Yeah, I would say the e quick and easy answer to that is yes. We've always kind of considered ourselves like the cartoon network of American variety arts. You know, by day, it's family appropriate. And in the dark of night, it isn't necessarily family appropriate. Mm. At the same time, you can take the same act, change the outfit the performer's wearing, and alter how you're talking about it. Virtually the same act that you're presenting to the seven-year-olds in the afternoon is being presented to, you know, the 25-year-olds at 11 at night. And because of those slight changes, they feel that it's a complete world of difference. <laughs> it's, just, it's the same show. That's what Christopher T. Magician was talking about, the exact same show with different audiences. All you do is change the attitude and change the outfits. Exactly. I'm not saying that we, you know, we, do, we do bring in occasionally you know, some, some artists that play more in the blue realm that we wouldn't necessarily have as a part of our kids' shows. But yeah, so much of the material is really the same show. Um, that it's kind of beautiful just to see how people read it different. Sure. And if it's, it's, if it's fun and amazing, it's fun and amazing. Exactly. All right. We're going to switch gears here and go into a game. One of the variety artists' favorite games, Fact or Something John just made up. Does that sound like fun? Uh, sounds good to me. Is it Fact? Ooh. Or is it Something John just made up? Ah. Here's how it works. I'm going to read a headline and you're going to tell me if it's true. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it or if it's something I just made up. Are you ready? Sure. First headline here. Keith ran the last vaudeville house on Times Square. That is true. Bendelstiff family's um, Palace of Variety and Free Museum of 42nd Street lived on 42nd Street between 6th and Broadway. As we were moving in, Slots of Fun, which was an old porno theater, was moving out. Okay. There was a set of buildings you know, on 42nd Street that were operated by an organization called Shishama. And Shishama basically takes corporate building spaces that are currently unused and turns them into places for artists to create. Mm. So for three years, um, we were basically had a space grant, if you will, and ran a vaudeville house on 42nd Street that um, was doing up to eight shows a day. Nice. And in the front had a whole little museum. You could pay an extra dollar to see the horrors of drug abuse, which you'd walk behind the curtain and, you know, see... Um, basically pickled punks in jars had wait wait pickled pickled what in jars um pickled punks they were in a sense jarred fetuses and Ooh. of various deformities my my favorite kind of experience was that two customers went in there they were these two jamaican nurses and were in there for a good 45 minutes and they came out let the people at the front counter know that the um the folks in the jars were not from drug abuse, and they went through each of the fetuses and said and explained exactly what the deformities came from. Oh. But at the end of all of this, said, please keep up your message. We need to keep kids off of drugs. <laughs> and walked out. We, got, we also had a kidnapping. Somebody unsealed one of the jars and took one of the punks. Oh. So I called our PR agent and then the um, NYPD and reported a kidnapping. Strange. Yeah. Um, it was kind of like the Palace of Variety was this beautiful era of New York that we got to see so many amazing artists creating new shows. You would walk backstage and, you know, it'd be one of the few places that you could have eight or nine New York clowns just having a place to hang out and talk shop. You know, for a good three years, it was 
you know, a vaudeville house, a variety arts community center, and a very affordable place for people to come put up shows and make mistakes and try things out um, and not have to worry about 5000 a month rent. Is that what ended it? Was it the rent that ended it? Um, a wrecking ball. I mean, the reason that we had the space was because it was in between corporations buying it. You know, we knew that it was a temporary space and that's why we could afford to be on 42nd Street, mm -hmm. you know, through Shishama, you know, through the grace of Shishama and what they do, you know, that allowed for that to happen. And we knew that eventually a wrecking ball would come in, destroy the theater and build a Bank of America skyscraper. Oh, so, you know, you go in knowing that, but it's a, it was a very sad moment when all of that finally happened. Well, let's, let's, let's go to the next one. Are you ready? Sure. Keith walked across the United States. That is correct. Or actually, I only did from Texas to New York the entire, um, I did six months of a nine month walk. Oh. Um, it was called the Global Walk for a Livable World. And it was approximately 80 individuals most of the time on a consensus community. And we would do kind of a environmental fair in the morning. And then we would walk 20 miles, then camp out in the next town. Did that day after day with Buddhist monks and punks and just a beautiful mix of 80 folks that necessarily wouldn't be together for any other reason. It taught me, you know, kind of the power of walking, of getting your message out there. I really can't think of a better way to see America than walking across it. That's amazing. It, I mean, it was definitely one of those life-changing moments. And then you finish the global walk for a livable world. You feel like it's, you've changed everything. And the first war in the Gulf started a week later. Oh, well, uh, maybe you made a difference in the places that you were at. And amongst individuals, you know, and we definitely, you got to see people changing their lives and just that one-on-one -on -one interaction. And, you know, to me, that's, that's the beauty of live performance of, and live activism is that, like, you create relationships. And it's the one thing that our telemediated lifestyle has really taken out. Even though there are all these variety shows happening on television, the ability for a uh, performer to connect with an audience live, to me, is the beauty of it all. Or for humans in general, just to be able to connect. Yeah, it, it, it's astounding. I'm a magician myself. In my opening routine, I make a dove appear. People have seen on TV a dove appear a million times with different magicians. But the reaction when someone sees that five feet in front of them, they're so amazed and it's so exciting to see that live. It's way different than being on TV. The number of people that walk up to me and, are, you know, they're 55, 60 years old and I'm the first sword swallower they've ever seen in person. Mm. You know, they may have seen Brad on television or somebody else do it, but yeah, never live and definitely never, in this case, up close. When you see a person really doing something like that, you're like, wow, that's amazing. Because on TV, I think there, there, there seems to be some sort of a, a filter like, oh, yeah, well, that person's swallowing a sword or he's making a dove appear. But, you know, it's TV. Exactly. And kind of the beauty when they see the sweat on the brow of the performer. Next headline, Keith has six cats. I do not have six cats. I, um, we do have two. I will admit to that. <laughs> oh, <do you? laughs> I share custody with my wife uh, of our dog. <laughs> so I know how important an animal is in your life. I, I, I like the cats around, but, you know, they need to, like, I really want performing goats, but it's hard <laughs> to have them. Um, they're considered livestock, and the farm laws of both Hudson, New York, and Brooklyn, New York aren't very goat-friendly. Uh -huh. My clown is a um, tramp, and I've always wanted a skunk, so it could be Kinko and Stinko. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but New York's a kill state because they're prejudiced and think that all skunks have rabies. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, California, you can't have a skunk in California because of the same reason. Yeah. It has nothing to do with their smell. It's the rabies thing. I mean, there's a lot of prejudice laws that New York and California share. Yeah, I'm sure. All right, next one. Keith has the same pair of clown shoes that he wore in his very first performance. I probably still have them around, but I know that Spears has built me a couple shoes since then. Um, I try to keep clown shoemakers in business because if the clowns aren't keeping in business, we're going to lose people knowing how to make clown shoes. Mm. 
And, you know, when you're tramping on clown shoes for mile after mile and every now and then having to try to chase the bus down to get back on it, um, you wear through soles. Were you wearing clown shoes when you were walking across the United States? I did try to do a third of it barefoot. Oh. But at that point, I was um, a little bit more hippie shoe than clown shoe. All right, next one. Keith, or actually Kinko, has been a United States presidential candidate twice. That is correct. Kinko ran in 2008 and 2012. Mm. He's yet to concede because most states do not count write-in votes. And mm. how can we ever know who won until we have counted every single vote? That is true. Um, but we had campaign managers. We had a um, campaign office in the city actively toured with the Kinko for President show in 2008. But that's also the same year that the global financial collapse happened. So while we were on the road, we were getting messages from theaters saying, we had to close our doors. We're going bankrupt. And if you want to sue us, I guess you can. But sorry, we won't be there in two days to let you in. Had probably a third to half of the venues cancel on on that particular tour. Wow. But Bindle Stiff still honored the payment to all the performers at our expense. Because even though the rest of the system shutting down, we're not willing to shut down on our performers. Sure. Now, did that get you lots of press? Got us lots of debt. It, um, oh. <laughs> I would say there was a, um, yeah, I mean, I was on NPR, you know, we were like, it, I'm always kind of appalled whenever the media uses circus and clown in, in a derogatory sort of way, you know, because how you can compare a politician and a clown to me is beyond because generally at the end of the day, people's lives are a little bit better after experiencing a clown and I don't see politicians treating the world in that way anymore. Yeah. And if we look at the history of circus, it actually is one of the most organized institutions out there. Um, the military back in you know, World War I, we were trying to study the circus and how we moved people. Um, they were sending German spies over to try to join shows hmm. in order to just see how you moved troops and equipment. Oh. So, you know, part of Kenko's mission was definitely to kind of change those perceptions, but also that it was time to put a real clown in the White House. That was that. Ooh. Or something John just made up. Ah. Now we're going to go right into our fan questions because every time I interview somebody new, I put on my Facebook group that you can ask questions of my wonderful guests. Uh, and by the way, anybody listening to this, you're welcome to join my Facebook group and ask questions. All right. So are you ready for some fan questions? Sure. Bring it on. Brian A. Miller, a juggler and recent member of the Variety Artist, says, by the way, do you know Brian Miller? I do know Brian. Okay. He says, ask Keith to describe his blockhead. Is it Kendama? Kendama. Um, Kendama trick. And ask him how many times he has done it successfully on stage. For those that don't know what a blockhead is, a blockhead is a traditional sideshow act in which you pound a nail into your head or screwdriver. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Kendama is a Japanese skill toy that over the past few years has gotten a lot of popularity. It's basically a cup and ball sort of thing. And, you know, you flip the ball up and you catch it in the cup or on the spike. So I combined the two ideas. Blockhead Kendama is a cup and ball act um, that has a spike involved that goes into my nose. Oh. So then I have, you know, the whole Kendama unit insert it into my head and I'm trying to flip the ball up into the cup. <laughs> it's one of those acts that your usual audience really won't care much about it. And I think that's because they're fine with just seeing the Kandama and just seeing the blockhead. They really don't understand, um, you know, how painful it is when you miss. Ooh. So I kind of, it's one of those acts that I really use primarily when I'm working juggling conventions or sideshow conventions or you know kind of quirky audiences that feel they've seen everything yeah so that's what it is the first time that it was ever successful i was doing it at a tattoo convention you know like you have the the tattoo gun still going it's still completely fluorescent lighting and it shocked me that i actually caught it and then it wasn't an audience that you know i kind of put it in there because i needed five more minutes of material 
but it, you know, it's not an audience that's completely connected. So it was kind of lost on the audience of how fabulous this particular moment was. It, it, there's, there's video on it and it is amazing. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and you know, since then I probably caught it a good five or 10 times, but you know, honestly, I only pull it out on stage maybe four times a year at this point. Sometimes it's, I, I find it in the b bottom of the case and like, oh, I'm going to just throw this into the show tonight. So it's not something I necessarily practice that often. Mm. You know, 10 or a dozen times that it's been successful out of, I don't know, a few dozen times that it's been seen in public. Um, but I, I, I feel that it's so goofy and so entertaining that whether it's successful or not, it seems to work. It is, it is goofy and entertaining. Just the blockhead portion of it itself. You know, just the putting the, the stick portion in is entertaining by itself. And then the actual trick itself, it, it's great. Thanks. Yeah, it's fun and goofy. <laughs> it is fun and goofy. You know, and it's one of the stuff, like it's a lot of times that I like to try to kind of pull bits from different traditions, you know, because it's, it's kind of like nerd skill toy meet sideshow. So you're taking something that a lot of people consider so nerdy and then mixing it with something that's so badass and then you end up with something in the middle. <laughs> now tell us one of your horror stories. Do you have a performing horror story for us? We, we spent 14 hours um, stuck between the Canadian and U.S. border once. Um, we mm. were on our way to do a kid show in, I think, Vancouver. We were you know, going through Blair, Washington to cross over the border. We were, you know, we're across the country from home. We have a van and a trailer filled, in a sense, with two shows, a kid show and an adult show. And they could not understand why we were carrying adult show props to go do this kid show. Mm -hmm. And we also had some merchandise, which um, for those that haven't crossed over the Canadian border, merchandise is one thing they really don't like, especially with the new tariffs, I assume. Oh. So we were then told that we have to go back into the U.S. And if we want to try to come over without all of this stuff, we can try again. The U.S. border then was confused about why we weren't let in and then wouldn't let us back into the U.S. Oh, you know, now they're, they're going to take our van completely apart, even though the Canadians just did and we haven't been anywhere else. But after many more hours pass, the American custom official tells us to get back in the room um, because you can kill a man with a newspaper if you know how. I don't want you around <laughs> me. Finally, we're allowed back in the U.S., we find a fella who actually owns a boat called Bindlestiff, and he has a storage facility near the water. So he lets us put all of the things in question into his storage. We go to a different point of entry, and the border guard from the earlier point of entry had changed positions. It was like, I will take them personally. So the same guy that went through our van the first time did it again. Uh -huh. um, one performer had a questionable zine. What, what is that? Zines were, you know, back before internet, were little magazines that folks created, you know, that were kind of artistic projects. Okay. And you found the, the whole zine culture was like big in the late 80s and through the 90s. And it was a way of kind of getting work, like self-publishing at a very um, kind of DIY level. Got it. So a performer had a, you know, a very radical zine, the questionable cover that you know created some issue and i think one performer had a couple bottle rockets in her bag so a few more hours were added to that weight mm -hmm. we get to the kids show about six hours late for whatever reason all but you know the producer and her kid had left you know that show was pretty much on a bust so then we um were very much touring by the skin of our teeth tonight's show will pay for tomorrow's breakfast sort of feel and we had to go street perform in um, oh, what's so yeah so we you know basically unloaded the trailer and tried to do enough street shows to get enough gas to go back to America. Oh man, what a nightmare! You mentioned something about uh, something burning down, a venue burning down or something. Oh yeah, we were in um, we we're in Louisiana and it's either Baton Rouge or Lafayette, I, but we had got a message the night before that the venue that we were um, going to be performing had a fire and was closed. And, you know, this is kind of as we're en route to the venue, we have nowhere else to go or be. So we, we still go to the town. The venue's still charred, but standing. Okay. Again, it's the reality that if we don't perform now, we're not going to be able to pay for the gas to leave your town. So, oh. you know, we got to do a show. 
so we actually run extension cords from from the power lines and power poles outside the venue to get enough power in the venue to get enough lighting and basic sound system to to do a show wow and the show went on at that point we were 23 people on the road it was the bindlestead family circus and circus ridiculous combined show oh yeah and we did a really giant fire show in that venue because there wasn't really anything left to burn wow we made our nut and kept moving i guess the fire marshals aren't showing up there saying don't use fire right i mean it's louisiana i don't think they showed up to put out the fire so (laughs) (laughs) So they're not gonna show up to put out your uh your show and, and, you know, and they want the circus to leave town. You know, I think that's kind of one of the beauties of being a traveling circus is that for one night, everybody loves you. Do you have one piece of advice for the beginner? My big thing to the beginner is be ready to suck a hundred times. Mm. You know, we all have these, especially when you're kind of beginning, these beautiful, passionate ideas. And, you know, and that's what makes us all, you know, go in the directions that we go. But. You know, I don't care how many times you're in workshops and and how many circuit schools you're in, but the live audience is a different reality. It takes being in front of lots of different live audiences to start understanding how to act in various moments. Go out there and, yeah, be ready for something to fail and then take notes of why it did and be ready to jump back on that horse and go out there again. So, yeah, I mean, my, my biggest thing to, you know, really any beginner is, you know, 15 minutes a day minimum and be ready to suck and then keep pushing through. And in your career, you were lucky or fortunate to do the 20 shows a day. So in five days I got, you know, I got through it all and I could move on. And then I, I I also go the um, the flying car Mazoffs went with a, um, had this one quote that I really liked that is it um, one show is equal to 10 rehearsals. Mm Mm-hmm which is kind of how I feel about the open stage. There's a lot of bits that I don't really rehearse any other time except on the open stage. But if I do, you know, once a month at the open stage, to me, that's 10 rehearsals. So at the end of the year, I have 120 rehearsals of that one bit. And then it's ready for the masses. And there are certain things that happen in front of an audience that'll never happen in your living room or your studio. Exactly. I mean, that's the beauty of live entertainment. You never know when you're going to have somebody freak out or a heckler who's not very well-trained heckler saying something completely inappropriate that you have to work with right? or the entire, you know, the curtain falling or power going out or robber from the place next door running through your theater. I mean, you know, like in a, any of this can happen. And for wait, many wait, of wait. Us, did, did that happen? It, it happened. I was actually at a convention and we were, you know, it was a juggling convention and there was um, a chase through that happened through the convention floor. Are you performing at the time? No, it, it was more just kind of a practice sort of session, but um, it definitely changed the feel for a few hours in the room. I'm sure. All right. How about the working pro? You have a piece of advice for the working pro? Oh, I have a, I have a few, I guess, in that realm. Um, I mean, my mom always taught me that to get through life, you need flexibility and a sense of humor. And to me, that, that kind of works in so many things. And I watch a lot of pros come into places. I mean, there's definitely the, the things that we need to be inflexible on because it's safety and us being able to do what we need to do. But when you say yes to a, a gig, you never know exactly what you're going to be walking into. So you kind of have to be ready for that. I'd say one of my biggest points of advice to, and this is both to professionals and audience members, is what I call the three block rule. Okay. And the three block rule is that you really don't talk about a show or a venue or a situation until you're three blocks away. Mm. And this can be, you know, if you're a pro and you're sitting in the audience and you're walking and you're talking crap about the show you just saw, you never know who's walking right behind you. True. If they're still following you at three blocks, they're stalking you and they deserve to hear whatever you say. (laughs) And then, you know, then same with the venue. Like, you know, you come out of a show and things didn't go very well. If you start, Going off in the venue, your manager is going to hear about it. If you're, you know, if you have management, your agency, that venue is not going to want you. Where if you would, you know, just say thank you so much for your time and walk out, it saves a relationship. And then, you know, once you're three blocks away, vent as much as you possibly need. That's great advice because there are times when we do a show that we think may not have gone how we wanted it to. And to us, it may not have been a great show, but to the audience member, the person who hired you, you know, they paid good money to see you. 
and they expected the best show possible. So their perception should be that, hey, they just saw a great show. Most of the times they don't even know that something went wrong. And there's so many times that, you know, I, I've been, um, I've seen myself do this. I've seen others do it where, you know, somebody comes up and compliments you, you know, that was great. And then the first thing out of your mouth is to let them know why it wasn't. Right. Which, I don't, you know, is, it, I think takes a few years to be able to turn that button off and be like, just able to be like, thank you so much. And it was so great to have you. Yeah, I think that that saves a lot of a lot of a lot of times you get rehired because you have that positive attitude. And I will pass also one bit of um, working pro advice that I got from Johnny Fox. Johnny Fox is another amazing performer who we lost this year. I consider him the, the best sword swallower of my generation. But he ta told me if you have a thousand dollar suit, you put that suit on when you go into a meeting. So when you ask them for whatever amount you're going to ask for, they may not be able to afford it. They may have to say no. But when they look at what you're wearing, they will know that's what you get. Uh, give us one book recommendation, or at least one book recommendation. Tell us why. My most recent book that I just finished, um, which I was only trying to read when I was stuck in transit on airplanes, was Mart Martin Ewan's Panto Damascus, which is One Clown's Alphabet. And it's basically a, a, a batch of stories that kind of, you know, starts with the first one is about a city that starts with an A and then B and C and, you know, kind of goes through the whole alphabet. So it's just a nice little thing of a odd stilt walking clown's perspective on the world. But then I also, you know, and I, for me, this is definitely coming kind of from the juggling realm because that's, you know, where I think my heart and my mind is the most, but we're going to find this, um, kind of in all of our you know, different realms, is to look at books that celebrate the odd and the unusual of your art form in the earlier days. You know, for me, it was like Charlie Holland's Strange Feats and Clever Turns, Ricky Jay's Learned Pigs and Fireproof Women, yeah. all of David Kane's History of Jugglers, and then Carl Hyatt Zietzen's major things on like the 4,000 years of juggling. Yeah. Um, you know, you see so much, you're, you're stealing from me, you're stealing this. But if you actually just go and look, you know, at what all the folks who are no longer alive have done, all this material that you're not stealing from somebody who's out there doing it now and you're getting inspiration from the tradition. You know, so I, I really push for people to look at the history from, where, from which we come. I'm going to put a bunch of those on your show notes. And back to what you were saying about the history of your art, whatever it may be. I do a magic trick that is so old that nobody's seen it recently. Mm -hmm. And when a new artist comes and sees me, a new magician comes to see me, they say, oh my gosh, where did you get that trick? And I'm like, well, that trick's two or 300 years old. Yeah, I stole it from the library. Yeah, wow. that's why you've never seen it before. <laughs> And, you know, I see battles in the contemporary circus community of people trying to crap upon the hundreds of years before them as opposed to celebrating and honoring it and especially just knowing it. Thanks, Keith, for doing my podcast. Where, where can someone get a hold of you or the Bindlestiff uh, Circus? Um, Bindlestiff.org is the best place to go. Um, we do, you know, a lot of, we offer grants for variety artists, especially in the New York area. We do the open stage show and then we do, you know, professional touring you know, youth development. So like we've got so many different programs, um, you know, kind of an altruistic nature of just trying to keep the variety arts alive. And somehow through all of that, we've been able to also survive and make a living doing this for a quarter of a century. I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. All right. And thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend. That's how we can spread the word. And don't forget to go to my website to get your free copywriting checklist at thevarietyartist.com. Also, make sure to get your free audio book from audible.com. Just go to thevarietyartist.com slash book to get your first book for free. You can reach me at john at thevarietyartist.com or join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist where you can ask me to ask questions of our wonderful guests like my friend Keith. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.